All right, Adrian, it looks like we might have everybody on. Are we good to go? Yes, we do. We were giving it just another minute to let some attendees join, um, but we are ready to get started now. Uh, welcome, everyone. I am Adrian Mertens. I am the Chief Communications Intergovernmental Relations Officer for the City of Santa Rosa, and I will be facilitating this evening's meeting. Uh, this is a glass fire rebuilding and recovery meeting hosted by City of Santa Rosa staff. Um, the meeting is intended to provide updates and answers to questions for those who are rebuilding or repairing their homes uh, within the city limits in the glass fire burn scar area. Um, and also for those who are living within the glass fire burn scar area in Santa Rosa and want to be kept up to date on what's happening with recovery and rebuilding. Um, I'll touch on a couple of quick logistics. Um, all community members that are joining this meeting are participating as Zoom attendees. And so your microphone is muted and your cameras are off and only today's panelists will be viewed on screen during the meeting. Um, also, if you're calling from a telephone for privacy concerns, Kaylee, our Zoom host, is renaming your viewable phone number to citizen and only the last four digits of your phone number will show on the screen. Um, also, we are recording this meeting. Um, and so if you are not able to uh, stay on for the entire meeting, um, this will be made available on our website in the next 24 to 48 hours and will be sent out in one of our future recovery updates this week. Um, I do want to thank everyone for taking time to join us this evening uh, as we embark on the new year. Uh, we recognize that there's a lot going on right now and we recognize this is an especially difficult and stressful time for those in our community who are rebuilding or repairing their homes. Um, joining me this evening are staff from our city's glass fire recovery team who have been working the closest on our efforts as we move forward from this disaster. Our hope for tonight is that we are able to support you with answers to any of the questions that you may currently have related to recovery. Um, and before we jump into updates from our panelists, I am going to turn it over first to uh, Mayor Chris Rogers and then to Council Member Jack Tibbetts, who represents District 3, which includes the areas that were impacted by the glass fire. Uh, both of them would like to offer just a few brief remarks uh, before we begin. And so I will start with Mayor Rogers. Thank you so much, Adrian. And first of all, I wanted to welcome folks. Uh, we are in a new year. We do have a new mayor and new council members, uh, but the priorities of the city haven't shifted. Uh, and we are here tonight uh, mostly to listen to, to see what barriers still exist for getting folks home and to maintain that commitment to do so and to work with you uh, to get everybody back. We know it's been very challenging with the pandemic. We know that even seeing a red flag warning this last week uh, has uh, induced some PTSD for folks. And we just want to make sure that you understand that we're here to support you and to hear from you. Uh, I represent the downtown area for Santa Rosa, but now as mayor also I want to be involved in all of these issues. So feel free to reach out to me if you do have anything that you need or any questions. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jack Tibbetts, who is our council member who represents District 3. Uh, and Jack, I know, has been working hard day in and day out to make sure that people get what they need as we move forward with our rebuild. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, to the folks who are attending tonight's meeting, I just wanted to take this opportunity to introduce myself to you. Um, for those of you who probably don't know me, um, I am your uh, council representative in Santa Rosa's District 3. Um, I, you know, my, I, I just want you to know that my heart goes out to you. I, I can't say that I've lost my, my home and I know what that's like, but I can tell you that um, you will have my unyielding support and I think I speak for everybody here who's uh, a part of this team at the city of Santa Rosa. I've watched Jesse Oswald and his team and a lot of the people um, who are here tonight uh, get us through multiple fires now and, and the pandemic. And um, in my opinion, they do a very good job. And I know that they'll help you to the best of their ability. And uh, if there's ever a time where you feel like something might not be getting through or you need just that little extra push, I hope you will email me so that I can um, work with them to try to find a resolution to whatever issue pre could present itself in your rebuilding process. Um, and so with that, I wanna give you my personal email address. It's the one I check the most. And that is J as in Jack, Tibbetts, T-I-B-B-E-T-T-S, 18 at gmail.com. So that email again is jtibbetts18 at gmail.com. And again, please reach out to me. 
um, so I can advocate for you. I, I will say that in the almost four and a half years that I've been on the council, being able to advocate uh, for fire survivors was probably my biggest honor and this is certainly um, no different and I wish you all the best. Thank you, Mayor and Council Member. Okay, so our staff panelists are prepared to give updates on several topic areas for our agenda this evening. Uh, and Kaylee's put the uh, topic areas up on the screen. Um, we will take up to two questions from attendees, um, if there are any following each of the staff updates. And then we will have additional time for more Q&A at the end of all of the updates. Um, and once we open for questions from attendees, I'll ask that you raise your hand using the raise your hand feature in Zoom. And if you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Um, all right, so let's get to our first staff update. Um, and we'll be starting with an update on Skyhawk Park and open space area, uh, specifically uh, to cover the damages uh, from the fire uh, repairs and the reasoning um, for the ongoing closure of the open space area. Uh, to kick things off, it'll be Jeremy Gundy, our Deputy Director of Field Services from Transportation and Public Works. Good evening, my name is Jeremy Gundy. I'm the Deputy Director for Field Services for the City's uh, Transportation and Public Works Department. So tonight I'm here to speak about the city's open space uh, located in the Skyhawk community off Mountain Hawk Drive. Uh, following the glass fire, the area was closed due, uh, to the public due to the hazards created when the fire burned through this area. Uh, the remain, uh, this remains closed until the repairs can be made and the hazards can be eliminated. Now, some of these hazards uh, identified include the fire damaged trees, wooden pathway steps, uh, the storm drain lids and the pedestrian bridge that burned. Uh, since the fire, the city has been working on mitigating the hazards by removing the trees, uh, replacing storm drain lids, and inspecting storm drain pipes. Initially, uh, a 160 foot section of damaged storm drain pipe was discovered. And then, following uh, some significant rain events that we had in December, a second section of pipe was also discovered. Uh, the discovery of this pipe prompted the city to harden the closure of the open space with some additional snow fencing and some signage and barricades. Um, and then city crews took immediate action to stabilize the surrounding area um, and are currently in the planning phase of, of the work, of the repair work. Along, the, uh, along with the two sections of the storm drain pipe that burned, um, uh, the, current, the crews are currently working on securing a contract for additional erosion control measures and purchasing the additional materials to repair the bridge and the steps. Uh, our goal is to reopen the area uh, to the public as quickly as possible. And we do appreciate your understanding and patience while we work towards uh, repairing this damage. Um, this concludes my report for the open space. And I'd like to turn it over to Sean McNeil, the Deputy Director of Environmental Services. Great, thank you, Jeremy. And First, I'd just like to say I'm sorry for the impact that the glass fire has had on you and your loved ones, and um, my heart goes out to you. Uh, but I'm going to speak a little bit about the impact that the fires had on the environment and what we can do to help protect that. So when buildings and infrastructure burn, uh, the pollutants from those uh, buildings in that infrastructure can make their way into our local creeks. And if they do get in there, then it's very difficult for us to get in and remediate that damage. So our efforts really are on trying to keep the um, pollutants in place where they are located and prevent them from migrating into our creeks. Um, and the way that we're doing that is by uh, providing free wattles uh, for people to put out uh, around their burned areas. We're protecting our storm drain system, which flows uh, directly from our streets into our creeks. So making sure that the in, inlets there, and then we're working with um, Jeremy Gundy's team to ensure that uh, the infrastructure that has impacts uh, to our creeks is getting repaired as quickly as possible. Uh, we do know that the burned plastic pipes uh, can emit many toxins, so it's a, a deep concern for our um, 
watershed task force to uh, abate these uh, burn storm drain pipes and get that damage clean, uh, cleaned up and repaired as soon as possible. So we are also uh, on the side of getting the park open uh, for everybody. Uh, it's part of protecting the environment. Another thing I want to just mention is when um, fire comes through an area and burns uh, heavy and hot, uh, it does change a lot of the characteristics of that landscape as far as its ability to shed water. What happens when it rains is that water then starts, instead of getting captured by plants and uptaken into the plants, it's now flowing over surfaces, potentially causing erosion, carrying debris down into uh, our local riverway, riverways, uh, which can cause debris flow and mud flows. So we are under a heightened um, worry for uh, potential uh, flood and debris flows and signs have been placed um, and just want to remind folks that um, if you are concerned about these um, hazards to just pay attention to the local alerts, please uh, go on to the city's website. Uh, we have a whole landing page rain ready on the alert site. Please take a look at, at what you can do on your property there, uh, as well as what you can do to protect yourself uh, should we uh, come under a situation of debris flows or mud flow events. We would know this well in advance before it happens. Uh, fortunately for us, the uh, rainfall that we've gotten so far is what we're calling Goldilocks rain, which is it's just the right amount to get vegetation growing in the burned areas and not enough to cause runoff and erosion. Uh, we would like a little more rain uh, than we've been getting, but um, it's, it's been good so far for um, the risk of flooding. Um, so could we move to the next slide, please? I also just want to reiterate that uh, the city is making these wattles available for, for free uh, for people who would like to uh, help the city protect our stormwater by uh, controlling the pollution running off from any burned properties. We have protected the storm drain inlets um, and these uh, with these wattles, these are weighted wattles. Uh, you can place these around the perimeter of a burned property to prevent any pollution from migrating off that property. It will be captured by these wattles. Uh, we also on our website have directions and how to use them and they're conveniently located at Skyhawk Park in Rincon Valley Community Park. Uh, so if you're in the burn scar area, please uh, take advantage of these free resources that the city's providing. And I also just want to mention not necessarily related to um, our stormwater system, but our drinking water system. Uh, the city did uh, go through and do extensive testing of the drinking water system in the affected areas. And we uh, noticed that there was no elevated risk of pollution from the fire, that uh, we were able to maintain positive pressure throughout the event. And that has not led to any contamination of the water. So the water is safe and dependable, uh, both for people who are living within the burn scar as well as people who are planning to rebuild. And with that, I think uh, uh, Jeremy and I are available for any questions. Thank you, Sean. Um, and just for those on the meeting, Sean referenced a website a couple times. Um, and so all the information he just shared is available on srcity.org forward slash glass fire recovery. Uh, there is a rain ready section um, as well as updates on Skyhawk Park and open space. Um, I did say we would take two questions before we move to the next update. So at this time, if there are any attendees with questions related to open space uh, or to Skyhawk open space area or to watershed protection concerns, um, we'll take those now. Mark Brown has a question. Mark, I have enabled your speaking permissions. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Brown. I do live in the Skyhawk subdivision. And I first wanted to thank you all for the work that you've been doing before, during, and after uh, the fire. It's been incredible. And um, 
not quite a question, but I'll get to a question. I completely support your closure of the open space area. Yes, it's an inconvenience, but uh, you guys have your good reasons. Um, and I just watch in disbelief as people walk by the signs and say it's closed. Apparently, uh, those signs don't count for them. And, um, and I do understand you guys will be putting something up that kind of explains the why for the closure. And perhaps that'll, that'll help. My question is, um, you know, I think we can look at this fire as a reset for the bramble that started to accumulate in the creek bed. And I know that it is a very difficult chore to keep up on that, but perhaps this is an opportunity uh, to start grazing goats or sheep in the uh, bottom of the creek bed and do that on an annual basis. And that'll really help with um, keeping that down. And I just wanted to ask if that has been considered. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Sean, do you wanna take that as far as the, uh, the watershed and the creek area? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Mark. Uh, we're definitely interested in looking at creative solutions for maintaining our uh, open space areas. Um, but I can say for a water quality perspective, we typically try to keep grazing animals outside of, of creeks. Um, just uh, that's, that's kind of the, the regulations around that. But it doesn't mean that we're not open to creative solutions for um, the issues that, that we face. Also, I want to mention that um, riparian areas, which are the, air, the vegetation around creeks, have special protections both from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife as well as the um, Regional Water Quality Control Board. So we are um, uh, not, it's not easy for the city to do um, a lot of vegetation removal in these areas um, as we're, they're trying to keep them uh, fish friendly. I don't know, Jeremy, if you have more to add about maintenance of the park. Well, I was just going to say um, to the beginning of, of the first part of Mark's question, we are, um, as you mentioned, we, yes, I can confirm we're working on signage um, that does provide more of an explanation as to the reasoning behind the closure. And um, we do expect to get those signs uh, produced and posted in the next few days. Um, and then on, uh, we will have further discussion on vegetation management. It wasn't one of the um, items called out on our on our agenda for tonight, but we did send out a survey to um, our residents within the Glass Fire Burns Car area and got a number of questions and concerns related to, um, you know, what the city would be doing um, in terms of prevention um, of future wildfires. And so uh, we did have that um, as an item. We were going to ask that question at the end and have our assistant fire marshal speak to that as well. So we will get to that um, to more information on that later in the meeting. Um, okay, and it doesn't look like we have any other hands on watershed protection. So we'll go ahead and move to our next staff update. Um, and we are going to cover fire damage trees on private property. And to start that off, we'll have Paul Lowenthal, our assistant fire marshal. And then following him will be Jesse Oswald, our chief building official. Good evening. Uh... Thank you, Adrian. Uh, thank you, attendees, for being here. Appreciate everybody's time. Uh, so diving right in uh, to fire damaged trees, unfortunately, we uh, got some experience in the effects of them following the Tubbs fire. A number of the staff on this call uh, have dealt extensively with uh, the concerns, uh, not only of ours, but of the communities following what we saw in both the Tubbs and the Nuns fire. And we took a lot of those lessons learned um, and moved them forward into the 2020 fire. Um, the first thing uh, that we wanted to cover was the addition of the fire damaged trees under the state's uh, debris removal program. So in 2017, that was not something that was available for us. However, it was something that we advocated for uh, and did a lot of work for behind the scenes that we hope is actually what played into having this program available first for the campfire in Butte County and then for us here in Sonoma County. Uh, what that means is that if you have fire damaged trees uh, that will uh, or are likely to die, or as to die as a determined by an arborist that is provided by the state, uh, within the next five years, those trees will be available to be removed through the state's right of entry program. 
So we saw a lot of needs for tree removals in 2017, and we understand that typically uh, the bucket of money available for, for tree removal is typically pretty limited. So there is a benefit uh, to enrolling in this program and having trees that are a threat to the right-of-way, meaning the tree could fall into a road or onto public infrastructure. So whether it's a water meter, hydrant, or some sort of public utility, uh, if the tree is likely to fall on that, it would be most likely eligible under the state's program. So we're really working hard to get uh, our residents into that. Um, obviously, not only does it remove the, uh, the tree, but it also remove uh, the eye hazard or the eyesore. Uh, one thing we did want to clarify, um, we are already getting a number of comments about a lot of trees, uh, whether it's in open space or throughout the burn area, is that we're not going to actually require the removal of every single tree uh, to be, uh, not requiring every single tree to be removed in the burn scar. Um, we're going to remove, uh, require the removal as many of them as we can that would be a threat to either right away, a threat to following, falling on a neighbor's property uh, or some or a uh, public safety risk, um, but you will see a lot of trees that are going to be left in place. Um, and just touching a little bit more on what I mean by uh, the bucket of tree money. So typically, on your policy, you'll have different line items. So there's policy or money available for debris removal, uh, for accessory structures, and then a lot of policies will actually have a very specific line item for tree removal. Um, I can speak from experience in 2017, losing my home uh, and a number of trees that had to be removed. Uh, I definitely would have stood to benefit uh, from a program like this. Uh, oftentimes you only have several thousand dollars to remove the trees. Uh, so offsetting some of those costs with the state's program would be beneficial. If it costs the state to remove $20,000 uh, to remove your trees, but you only had $2,000 worth of tree removal money, that's all that they would ask for in return. However, there's likely additional work that you would have to do on your property. So uh, if you had other tree removal work that needed to be done and you exhausted that $2,000, you would owe nothing to the state. Another issue that we're working on is the... Uh, PG&E tree removal issue uh, that has become quite a hot topic. So PG&E has been removing what they refer to as priority one and priority two trees within the glass fire burn area. Uh, several thousand trees have been removed. The issue that we have run into is that PG&E is not currently offering a wood removal program. So when a tree is felled on your property by PG&E is ultimately your responsibility to have it removed. The city and county uh, are both working to get that changed and working to have PGE e potentially uh, mitigate that. Uh, we're working with not only uh, our legal side, but also with the California Public Utilities Commission. So we understand that has caused a lot of concerns and a lot of issues within the uh, glass fire footprint, um, but know that we are still working to advocate on behalf of our community about uh, some of the issues caused by uh, those trees that have been felled. Another thing really quickly is there's also been concerns regarding some of the what appear to be fire uh, uh, trees that were uh, damaged or, or dead following the fire that uh, are not. So uh, we did have an arborist come through and removed a lot of the trees that uh, Jeremy had talked about earlier, um, but there's a lot of trees that had the foliage burned off of it, but an arborist has determined that those trees will survive. So with that, um, those will remain at this point in time, but we'll continue to monitor it. So if you have concerns, again, feel free to reach out to us, um, but know that uh, it's definitely not something we're ignoring. Uh, we are actively working on it, uh, similar to what we did in 2017. Uh, we're encouraging people to take the proactive approach and, and deal with the trees as they can. Uh, we know that there will be some property owners uh, that uh, can't or won't deal with them. Um, not to understand what they're going through, but we understand also the concerns of those neighbors that do want to see the trees removed and ones that do need to be, we'll have a process in place to deal with that. So we're currently working to modify uh, an ordinance that we have right now to deal with uh, remaining fire damaged trees that need to be removed, both in the tubs, nuns, and now glass fire footprints. And that is uh, all I have. I'll let Jesse jump in and talk about any proactive tree removal permit requirements from the city. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for spending some time with us this evening. Um, like all of my colleagues, we're very sorry for the losses you've suffered. 
and this team is is committed to working with you to get through and get you all back home and get things taken care of for your property. So uh, trees, fire damage trees on private property, specifically with this segment, uh, it's, it's really about these trees that are considered either heritage trees or protected trees that you may have on a property, on your property, that could be damaged and you wish to remove those. And, and again, this segment is specifically for those folks that have not enrolled in the state's ROE program for tree removal or have some other method that they're going through. And it really is targeting these heritage or, or protected trees. And there, I'm gonna give a summary of the, the process, but we do have a, a very uh, clear step-by-step -step process on the, the same web, website that, that we're all referencing this evening. Uh, basically what it comes down to is if you have one of these trees and there's a list on the website as well of these trees uh, that you uh, believe is damaged, want to have it removed, we have a no cost application to submit to us to have the tree uh, removed in, in, in a quick part of this that uh, makes it easier for us to uh, approve is again, uh, certified arborist would evaluate the tree and provide a statement uh, that the tree is, is either hazardous or dangerous and that it does need to be removed in their professional opinion. With that submittal coming to us here in planning and economic development, we would uh, process the, the removal uh, 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 approval quickly, uh, uh, especially when it's accompanied by that certified arborist report. So we can um, help you with those. And again, reach out to myself or any of the team uh, to, to give you any more details on that. And again, we do have some great information on our website. Great. Thank you, Jesse. And again, that website is srcity.org forward slash glass fire recovery. And there is a button icon on that homepage, um, uh, damaged trees and all of the information that uh, Jesse covered and that Paul covered is on that page. Um, all right, I will uh, stop now to see if there's any questions on fire damaged trees on private property before we move to our next staff update. So if you do have a question, use the raise your hand feature uh, to let us know. All right, and seeing no hands raised, we'll go ahead and move to our next staff update. Uh, which will be focused on debris removal. And so I will first turn it over to Kemplin Robbins, our assistant fire marshal from the Santa Rosa Fire Department to give an update. Um, and then that will be followed by Jesse Oswald again uh, with some additional information. Thank you, Adrian. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. Um, Paul Lowenthal, excuse me, Paul Lowenthal and I are the co-leads for the Santa Rosa Debris Task Force. And we are glad to see that several residents have already had their parcels cleared of fire debris and are mostly waiting for soil sampling results before they are approved to begin the rebuild process. Currently, with the exception of a couple parcels, all residents with damaged or destroyed structures have entered into either the state consolidated debris removal or private debris removal program and the task force has now focused our attention on providing resources and support to those residents who have non-structural or minor debris remaining on their property. We wanna remind those residents to work with their insurance companies before removing debris in case a claim was or can be made on the removal of these items, which can include fences, trampolines, play structures, patio furniture, barbecues, covers, and recreational sporting equipment. We are issuing exemptions for those who would like to take these minor de burn debris items to the landfill for disposal. And you can find and complete the conditional exemption form at srcity.org forward slash glass fire recovery under the hazardous waste and debris removal icon. We have received questions related to treated wood waste, specifically railroad ties, which are considered a hazardous waste. And we are working with the state currently to determine the best way to pick up and dispose of these items. If your property has treated wood waste and you have questions on proper disposal, please feel free to reach out for, to us for any assistance. We do have cleanups underway in city limits. Although we don't receive notice before work is initiated on a property, once we are aware, we do track this information. 
there will be a deadline established for debris removal completion. And if it seems that a parcel is waiting for this removal, it may be a state consolidated, consolidated debris removal program property. Parcel debris removal is prioritized based on risk areas, which can include schools, waterways, environmentally sensitive areas, and vulnerable populations. Cal OES has created a debris operations dashboard that can provide specific details of the cleanup process for all fires in the state. The city has added the link for this dashboard on our srcity.org forward slash glass recovery webpage for reference. If there are any additional questions or concerns on the debris cleanup and removal, you can reach us at rebuild at srcity.org or call 707-543-4649 and that is all I have for now. All right, hello again, everyone. Uh, Jesse Oswald, Chief Building Official. Uh, we'll now um, talk about some of the uh, next parts of the process, which is actually our, our permitting, our rebuilt center, and uh, permitting for, say, repairs and rebuilding. Uh, hey, Jesse. Can I just stop you for one sec? I'm sorry. Um, I just want to make sure there weren't any questions on debris removal before we move into that next item. Um, and it looks like we do have one. Um, Keely, you want to facilitate that? Of course, Sonia, I have enabled your speaking permissions if you're able to unmute your microphone. Hi, good evening. Thank you, City of Santa Rosa people for being here for us. Um, I had submitted this question earlier. Um, our home is in Rincon Valley and it was um, partially burned. We still have a little, some of the structure is still standing. And uh, I just was up in the neighborhood today and I've gotten, talked to my neighbors at length about their concerns. When we have high winds, our roofing material is blowing off our house. Um, we have not been able to settle with our insurance company as far as getting debris removal. Um, Anyway, um, our latest windstorm this week, one of my neighbors found 45 pieces of our roofing material in his yard. It's uh, scratched up his car. And I don't know what to do at this point. We are working with an attorney, but we would really like to put some pressure on our insurance company to approve uh, our debris removal. And so we can move forward and keep our neighbors out of harm's way. Hey, Sonia, thanks for the question. Uh, really quick, just to clarify so I can answer it appropriately. Are, are you already submitted, have you already submitted a private debris removal application for your residence or did you submit a state uh, right of entry form? We, we did a private one and I understand that we could not do a state one because um, there are still portions of our house still standing. Okay, so I'll try and answer this as quickly as I can. So. Uh, we surveyed uh, all homes within the glass fire burn, burn uh, scar mm -hmm. and uh, found approximately 10 homes that were similar to what you're describing where there was more than one wall standing uh, and are currently submitted all those addresses to the state for potential inclusion into the program. Uh, all but four different properties submitted private debris removal applications and only four actually submitted the right of entry form. Uh, the state did initially deny that a process, the, the request, and we're in the process of filing an appeal uh, to include the properties that submitted a right of entry that are similar to what you're describing into the state's program. So that's still underway. So it, it was an option um, that we were working to fight for our residents for. For the private property uh, debris removal programs, it sounds like you've got an application in for it, but your property or your insurance will not allow it to proceed because they're not considering it a full debris removal. Is that correct? Um, they haven't, well, I guess they yeah. haven't decided whether or not they, we should remove the foundation. They had told us before Thanksgiving that um, they had approved it and then they, our attorney went back and said, does that mean you're approving full removal, including the foundation? They said, oh, wait a minute, let us get back to you. Well, they finally sent an engineer last week. So we're, it's, we're going on almost two months since they had you know, looked at our 
debris removal estimates, and they just really seem to be dragging their feet. And at this point, it's it's not looking good. I mean, I'm just really concerned about, I'm, I was just there, I see pieces of metal gutter hanging off the end, end of the roof. And I understand. So it sounds like the process is being held up until the determination can be made on the status of the foundation. So from a safety standpoint, we can work with you offline, uh, myself, Kemplin, and or Jesse Oswald, just from a, a structural stability and a safety standpoint for the neighborhood, because I'm 99% confident I know which property you're talking about. Uh, we can try and help work to get uh, you what you need from documentation that shows that it is destroyed, the structure itself to at least move forward, regardless of what they do with the foundation to kind of mitigate the threat. Much appreciated. Thank you. That's what I needed. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Um, and I am seeing no other hand, so I will uh, send it back your way, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. So the um, the the next uh, part of our, our our mission for all of us here, you you folks that have lost your homes or have damage, is going to be the the permitting process. Our Permit center, so to speak, is uh, all, all permitting for the glass fire recovery is going to be done through permanent city staff, but we will be prioritizing to meet the same time frames that we committed to for the Tubbs fire rebuild. Um, inspections, we will prioritize as well uh, to keep projects moving once permits are issued. Um, our uh, emails and calls will go to the same contact information that's contained on the website, and it's essentially the the primary contact and best way to get uh, documents to us is rebuild at srcity.org and that team will get everyone involved that needs to uh, to get your projects moving. Um, so for repairs on homes uh, that that were not destroyed so we simply need some some permits to to do any any measure of things that is not a, a home replacement. You will likely need permits. Um, and if, if you're not sure if you need permits for it, certainly reach out to me directly. My contact information is here on the screen. It's joswald at srcity.org, and my direct line is 543-3249. Uh, there are some, I have some brief examples of, of things that do not need building permits uh, to repair or replace. Uh, fences that are seven feet tall or less, uh, accessory structures that are 120 square feet or less, uh, those are structures that we consider truly accessory structures like sheds, play structures, and things like that. Um, retaining walls uh, don't necessarily need uh, permits and inspections unless they're over four feet tall, and that measurement is from the bottom of the footing to the top of the wall. And any height retaining wall does require a permit if it's holding what we call a surcharge. In other words, it's, it's holding a hillside back behind it. There's pressure on the wall. Uh, landscaping and ir irrigation generally don't need permits. Um, but when we do get into to, uh, items that do need, need permits, most times plans will be required. Sometimes it can be uh, very simple plans. Uh, homeowners can draw their own plans. Uh, we can help you through that process and provide you information specifically on what you need to see or we would need to see. Um, and there are, uh, there's the possibility always that uh, certain permits don't even need plans. It's simply an application submitted to us and we can work through describing it uh, well and issue a permit in that manner. So that's, that's a brief overview of, of uh, permitting for repairs. Uh, rebuilding is gonna follow uh, essentially the same processes that had had in, our, in the past in, in our past fire. And uh, the new homes, uh, replacement homes will have to meet the 2019 California building and or residential codes. Uh, the city council, did uh, exempt uh, glass fire rebuilds from the recently passed all electric only uh, ordinance for Santa Rosa. So that's not going to be a concern if uh, folks were worried about all electric only. Uh, we certainly encourage the all electric only for the, the, the benefits it provides the environment. Uh, minimal landscaping is required on rebuilds for the front yard. Uh, uh, Gabe Osborne will be coming up after me to describe some more details about landscaping and a, bu a bunch of our tools that we have to assist uh, with that. And again, um, all of our submittal requirements that we have step-by-step -step processes for 
what it takes to develop a full permit submittal package. Uh, if you have trouble finding any of that information, again, reach, reach out directly to me at joswald.srcity.org, or you can call me directly at 543-3249. And with that, I will turn it over to Gabe Osborne, uh, unless we want to take questions before we go into landscaping and tools. No, let's go ahead and go to Gabe. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, good evening, everyone. And I, I'd like to start by just mimicking what my colleagues have already mentioned. Um, truly sorry regarding the situation and what you're going through right now. Um, both Jesse and I were intimately involved in the rebuilding efforts associated with the Tubbs fire. Um, we've really lived that process for three years now, and we understand some of the struggles that, you, that you're going through. Um, and most of what I'm going to touch on now is, is some of the tools that we developed that really cater to the, the full on rebuild. That, that is the heavy lift that's going to take a significant amount of time. Um, and we understand that that's on a different timeline um, than, than potentially some of those other quicker restoration efforts. Um, and in 2017, we saw a significant amount of permitting activity in the first quarter of 2018. And then we saw quite a bit the next year and we still see permits now. So we understand that that timeline is a very personal decision. There's a lot that goes into that but we wanna make sure we have the appropriate tools in place to help you make the decisions and support you along that process. And as Jesse mentioned, for a full rebuild, there is a, a whole permitting process to rebuild the house. And that permitting process, the heavy lift behind that is usually done by the licensed professionals you hire. So you will have an architect that designs and you will have a contractor that builds. Um, what we found in the Tubbs fire is there's a lot of steps along that process where you are actually making decisions. And those decisions are based on the design of the home, um, they're based on the placement of the home because we have created flexibility in our process to where you don't have to build back exactly what you had before. So in order to make these decisions, we wanted to present as much of this information as possible in a self-help sort of format. Um, that was critical in Tubbs Fire because we just had a significant number of people going through this, but I think it's equally as important in this uh, period of time because of COVID and our restrictions, we're trying to publish as much information in a digital format as possible. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the important decisions, because we do have flexibility, if you're going through the rebuild, is really how do you want that home to look? And we created as much flexibility as possible. Um, we knew that if there is any silver lining at all in this whole process, as you rebuild that home, hopefully it gives you what you needed. And hopefully it creates a home that more better matches the lifestyle you're currently in now. Um, that can involve moving it on the site, that can involve shrinking or growing the footprint. Sometimes that can grow, it involve growing height, so adding stories to that. An important piece to that decision before you even start that process or what are referred to as setbacks. So that's the distance that a structure must maintain from side, front and back property lines. And it's really critical to understand that box as you go through it, um, because you can make decisions about how large you can move that foundation, or excuse me, expand that foundation, or if you can slide it forward or backward to increase your backyard. So the tools that we've provided are available on the website that Adrian mentioned, which is srcity.org slash glass fire rebuild. On that front page, there is a link to a parcel report search tool. You can click on that and it gives you the ability to either search by entering an address or you can search a map and select a parcel and you would be presented with this format. And as you can see now, the planning tab is highlighted on the static image. And what this does is give you very unique information about your parcel. So those setbacks will be that setbacks that apply to your parcel and those are minimum numbers. And an important piece to this is we try to create as much flexibility as possible. So those setbacks may be less aggressive than the previous home. So for example, you may have had a 10 foot side yard setback. And in some situations you can reduce down based on zoning requirements to five feet. So there might be a little more flexibility. So it's important to note, it doesn't necessarily have to go back in the same um, placement that the foundation was prior to the fire. Um, in addition to that information, we also have some standard information associated with fences. How tall do they need to be? Can I put lattice on top of it? Um, what if I wanted to build an accessory dwelling unit? We have information on the page associated with that. Um, so this is really catering to the property owner that's trying to make decisions on how to move forward with the parcel. And once the building permit is applied for, this website will also show a status of that permit. 
So you can click on the permits tab, you will see information about the review timelines, the comments generated when it goes under inspection. You can also track the inspection, see what was scheduled, whether it was approved or denied on our side. Um, so we found that in the Tubbs Fire, this was a very helpful tool and we were able to incorporate all the specific data for the glass fire to allow it to, to translate over to that fairly well. Next slide, please. So in addition to um, a lot of the parcel specific information for um, making those decisions, we also found that property owners are also, we're also very interested in just really general information. Um, what you can see here is we have a rebuilding document library that's also available on the same website. Um, what's available now is some information that's really specific to the processes that you're going through, um, which might be doing still smoke damage. If you've evolved past that, you might be looking at rebuilding. So it gives some information about what that building permit needs to look like. Those documents will expand with time. Um, for example, in the Tubbs Fire, we produce documents for reestablishing mail service. We produce documents for what to expect when you're reoccupying your home, um, as well as impacts to the street as construction commences and noise, things of that nature as construction activities ramped up. So this will grow with time as we translate those documents over, uh, but this is a really good resource to check for information that's really more global to the rebuild. Next slide, please. And one of those documents, as Jesse mentioned, is associated with landscaping requirements. Um, and the reason we want to focus on this, um, as you dive into the rebuild, this may be something that the contractor pushes back on the property owner. Um, we did see this in the Tubbs fire. Uh, landscaping is required when it's associated with a building permit. So if you're pulling a building permit to reconstruct the home, a small amount of landscaping in the front yard will be required. Under state requirements associated with water use efficiency, um, there are certain requirements that go along with landscaping and those requirements historically have required a property owner to hire uh, someone to actually design a plan and submit it to show that it's consistent with state guidelines for water use efficient uh, landscaping. Um, what we tackled in the Tubbs fire, because anytime you bring in another licensed professional, another plan, that can add a layer of cost. Uh, we actually developed a program where you have free templates that you can use that are designs that can be scalable to your lot and they can be submitted free of charge. You can use them freely and they can meet that requirement. So it should help deflect some of that cost you would normally have on hiring a landscape architect. Um, we also have consultation services available within our permit center that will help you navigate that. Um, so these are just some things to think about um, as you move forward based on where you are in the process. These documents are here. We completely understand that you might not be ready to dive into these quite yet, um, but just know that there's digital resources and then both Jesse and myself have committed to work with people directly to help them navigate any of these documents or any other issues that aren't presented on the website. So that concludes my overview. And at this point, Jesse and I are available to answer any questions you might have about the rebuilding process. Thanks, Gabe. Um, and one thing I wanna note uh, that URL that's, oh, oh, we just lost the screen, but that's okay. Um, the srcity.org forward slash glass fire rebuild. That's actually a new website. We just published that this week. Um, it's kind of an extension of the recovery website that has been available since very shortly after the glass fire, but this is really focused um, on the uh, home repair and reconstruction process and everything related to permitting and, and everything that Jesse and Gabe covered. So um, if you haven't been on that site and you are repairing or rebuilding your home, it is something we encourage you to take a look at. Um, all right, and I will open it for any and all questions that anyone may have on any recovery topics at this time. Okay, and I'm not seeing any hands immediately, and I did want to be sure that we addressed um, the question that we received um, a lot of feedback on in the surveys we sent out, and that was how will the city be addressing the threat of future wildfires in our community. Um, and so, Paul, if you could take a stab at that one, um, and perhaps in the meantime, we might get more hands. Thank you. So yeah, uh, like Adrian has said, we saw uh, a pretty common theme in a lot of the responses that we got uh, regarding, regarding uh, not only vegetation management and the burn scar, but around it as well. Uh, there was feedback and comments regarding Annandale State Park, uh, Howarth Park, Spring Lake, 
uh, a lot of the open spaces. So a couple pieces to that. Um, a number of the questions and concerns were actually identified and addressed in what we refer to as our community wildfire protection plan. So for those of you that are not familiar with it, uh, the city approved and adopted a plan uh, that we have developed over the last year and a half or so uh, through council uh, in September of 20. Uh, ironically and unfortunately, uh, it was actually approved just a matter of weeks uh, before the glass fire occurred. And it did identify the greatest threat to the community as the area between the tubs and the nuns directly above Skyhawk. So we had been working on uh, plans uh, to implement uh, for that area. Uh, unfortunately, we saw the fire do exactly what we were worried it would do. Um, but nonetheless, we're still committed to doing not only work in that same area, uh, but around the city. So there remains a threat uh, to our community, primarily right now uh, in the uh, Melita Road corridor, um, Kind of the backside of Oakmont uh, from what we would typically have as our normal south southwest wind flow where it could potentially push a fire out of Spring Lake or Howard Park direction towards those areas. Uh, we know there's a lot of uh, unburned fuels and risks to the area up around uh, the Flamingo and really multiple uh, parts of our community including what burned in the Tubbs and Nuns fire with the regrowth that's occurred. So with that, uh, we are doing a lot. We're currently applying for three different grants. Uh, those grants, uh, speaking very generally, total about $3.1 million and are fit into three different types of programs. One is for evacuation route hardening. So a lot of our major streets uh, in and around uh, our community, primarily on the east side of town. Uh, we're looking at doing uh, fuel reduction along those evacuation routes. We're look also looking at doing uh, vegetation management and fuel reductions in open spaces uh, that include areas like uh, the Skyhawk open space, um, as well as a lot of other areas uh, in and around the east side of town. So we're very uh, aware of the concerns, we're aware of the risks, um, and we're currently working not only towards grant applications, uh, but there's also uh, been an overwhelming request and support from our community to potentially use PG&E settlement funds. Uh, we have provided uh, council with information, uh, both through our public safety, the council's public safety committee, uh, the um, economic subcommittee, as well as to our full council. Uh, and currently our ask specific to vegetation management is five and a quarter million dollars. Uh, that is geared towards $5 million uh, to start working on actionable items that are identified in the community wildfire protection plan and then a quarter of a million dollars to put together another plan in five years from now uh, so that we continue to meet the needs uh, of our community. Most recently, uh, we currently have a budget that's specific to weed abatement. Uh, that is what most residents up in the Skyhawk uh, area specifically, as well as out in Oakmont and uh, the Rinkin Valley area have seen the city do. There's uh, a lot of the work that we do on our weed abatement program. Uh, we are aware that based on how the fire burned, uh, in Skyhawk areas that were heavily brushed that we would not typically have done weed abatement work on, uh, we will be doing weed abatement work on where it is required. So we're going to be coming forward with an additional request for funding uh, through council uh, based on the additional needs uh, for weed abatement following uh, the glass fire, meaning areas that we didn't have to deal with in the past, we'll have to deal with now, um, as well as other work projects that we're gonna wanna do in the area. So there's a lot of work uh, that will be done that needs to be done. Um, and quite honestly, we look forward to working with our community partners and, and making a lot of these things happen. Uh, we've been eager and, and wanting to get a jump start on it. Um, we have made several unsuccessful attempts for grant funding since the 2017 fires to do a lot of the work that people have specifically asked for. Uh, know that we're working very closely with council uh, and very close with um, our consultants to work on securing grant funding so that we can absolutely uh, take advantage uh, of the plan that we have in place now to start mitigating the risks and protecting our community from uh, additional wildfires that seem to be coming the new normal here locally, unfortunately. Thank you, Paul. All right, and so I will ask our, oh, it looks like we have a question. Julie, you wanna grab that one? 
Brian, I have enabled, enabled your speaking permissions. If you can unmute your microphone. Brian, are you able to unmute your microphone? It looks like we, he might have gotten disconnected. Let's wait a moment and see if he's able to jump back on. Okay. Looks like Mark Brown has a question in the meantime. Mark and I, I have enabled your speaking permissions. Uh, good evening again. And again, thank you for everything. I appreciate you guys putting your time in tonight. and. It's more of a request as you move forward with your vegetation management. And I ask that you use a science-based approach for contemporary wildfire science, which is exactly included in your community wildfire protection plan. And I ask that you not follow the, the poorly informed and fearful approaches that some people have been asking for, such as completely removing all vegetation from our open space. That quite frankly is not the answer to our problem. Um, our answer is for homes to be hardened and people to take a house out approach. And if you look at all the homes that were destroyed in Skyhawk, and I've looked at every one of them, it was because what was done on a person's property or their neighbor's property and not the wildland area that burned their homes down. So I ask you to take a science approach, science-based approach. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Mark. Uh, for background awareness, yeah, we are familiar and have had some HOAs uh, throughout Santa Rosa that I, I don't want to minimize it, but um, have had some knee-jerk reactions where they want to uh, do something that may not be in their best interest, meaning we typically understand that uh, there's dollar amounts to mitigating different risks. And we want to make sure that the money that is spent is going to do the most good for our community. So yeah, I've, I have watched some HOAs remove all their, spend their money on um, removing all the fuels within the open space. Uh, the larger diameter fuels, the brush uh, throughout the entire area, and it doesn't truly mitigate the risk of wildfire. So we are uh, very aware of your concerns. Uh, as you indicated, it is addressed. The scientific based approach is outlined in the plan. And our goal is also to help educate the community on what they can do to harden their structures. Uh, it was uh, something that was actually noted by Cal OES and FEMA, the director of Cal OES and the Region 9 uh, coordinator from FEMA uh, were in Skyhawk immediately after the tubs, uh, sorry, the glass fire, and actually looked into the Skyhawk open space and saw a lot of the fuels, a lot of the landscape materials um, that were used in that area um, that, act that actually, in some cases, helped support the spread of fire. So uh, our goal, again, is to, is to help mitigate those risks and to help educate our community on what they can do in their rebuild process uh, to to build something that is more likely to withstand embercast and withstand fires in the future. All right, thank you. Uh, any further questions from our attendees? Okay, seeing none, uh, we have put the contact information back up on the screen. Uh, so you can jot that down and uh, that is a way to reach any of us um, uh, about various recovery questions. So please feel free to reach out um, if at any time you have any questions. And I want to thank you again for your time tonight. And uh, again, this meeting will be uh, record. It's being recorded and will be posted on our recovery website in the next day or so. Uh, so thank you to everyone and have a good evening.